Alright ladies and gentlemen, and hello to a look at War Thunder's Beginner's Pack. In this video I will look at the pack vehicles and talk to you a little bit about the history of the two vehicles that you'll get in this premium pack as well. The pack itself will cost you around about $4.99 US dollars, so $5 US, uh, I can't remember the exact exchange rates, a relatively small amount. It's actually quite a good value pack. Uh, with this pack, you get two rank one premium, well, two rank one vehicles, not both premium. Uh, you get 1,000, sorry, 120,000 silver lions and seven days of premium time. So, is this a good offer? Well, yes, all of this is outside of a pack. You would be cost you around about 10 to 15 US dollars. Uh, so, you do get value for your money in this pack. In that respect, 120,000 lions will help you as you start, meaning you can buy vehicles a little quicker than you would if you had just started normally. The premium time, for 7 days, will boost your research points and give you a bonus to silver lions again as well. So if we look at the premium um, doobidoo account, so the premium account here, as you see, you get a 100% research boost and then about 150 lines boost, uh, 200 lines boost even, sorry, uh, sort of in in everything. So it get, it's relatively good. Um, the other thing as well, it gives you limited access to the dynamic campaign missions, which are pretty useless. Uh, allows the creation of a four-man squad, or four-women squad, or four-people squad, or four-lizard squad, or whatever you are. Uh, and a four decal slot, so you can have more decals on your vehicle. Yay! Um, as you can see, it, it's relatively expensive if you buy it outright. Uh, usually I get this in sales just to keep it topped up because I tend to hate not having premium time. Uh, you, you can pretty much top it up for a year every year or so for not that much. Um, it's usually around about uh, 8,000 Golden Eagle or something like that, sort of half price. You, you can get 50-60% off on this usually, so well worth waiting for a sale to actually get it all topped up. So, the vehicles you get are the M3A1, so we'll just head out of this view of the beautiful P36. So, the M3A1, US Marine Corps, and this is a premium tank. Uh, it will make you your start in the American Ground Forces uh, tree and the grind a little quicker at the start. And um, it, will, it will allow you to grind up to about rank 3 vehicles without too much problem. The thing with a premium vehicle, uh, because I expect I'm going to have a couple of new players seeing this hopefully, uh, is with a premium vehicle you actually get a little bit more reward for it. So you get a bonus to your research points and a bonus to your silver lines. So as you can see you get 300% research, 60% lines. With the standard vehicle uh, you get 30% lines and 200% research. So you get a fair bit extra with a premium tank. It also means your crew skill uh, these skill points here which help your vehicle get a little bit better and help everything a little bit more for you do go up a little bit quicker as well. Uh, one major negative for the pack is the P36A as it's not a premium. Uh, so this is the P36A you get with the, the pack and um, that means you don't get any more silver line or reward with it. It's the same as the regular tech tree version which is a big, big minus towards it. Uh, it is a unique and a nice collector's item though, and a huge improvement over the reserve planes, uh, the P26 for instance, but it has no extra properties making it better than the regular tech tree variant. Uh, one nice thing though is it is a very pretty plane, you do get the decals marking it out as uh, Lieutenant Rasmus Rasmussen's plane, uh, so that's kind of nice, uh, and it is a slightly, you know, it's just got a different... Um, different coat of paint over it than the regular tech tree variant. If we look here you'll see the regular tech tree variant. There you go. And you can see a different paint scheme and I believe there are actually some bullet holes in it. I'm not 100% sure but it kind of looks like they've actually put some bullet holes in the 86 there which is fitting for this plane. Uh, anyway I won't get talking too much on history at the moment because we will be looking into that next. So as we start our talk on the vehicles let us start with Lieutenant Phil Rasmussen's, sorry, I, I'm going to pause with that one because my stammer is just making it very hard. Uh, Lieutenant Phil Rasmussen's plane, and that is the P-36A. Let's head to take a look at that now. 
Okie dokie. So, Phil Rasmussen uh, was born on the 11th of May 1918. He joined the US Army Air Corps in 1940 after training. He was assigned to the 46th Pursuit Squadron at Wheeler Army Airfield in Hawaii. On the morning of the 7th of December 1941, Japan declared war on America. The first attack happened at the airfield, knocking out the majority of the fighters, refueling and arming vehicles. Twelve pilots in total got to the air. Lieutenant Phil Rasmussen, in his pyjamas, ran out and found an unscathed P-36 Hawk. Although a little older than the more powerful Allison engine P-40, which is actually a pretty much an um, Allison engine strapped into the P-36 Hawk, um, the P-36 Hawk was a very good little plane, um, the twin wasp radial engine P-36 was still capable with great turning ability and roll rate. The plane was capable of taking it to the majority of the Japanese planes, although the A6M0s were a little bit of an unknown sort of a foe. Lieutenant Rasmussen flew to, now I do apologise about butchering pronunciation here, Kaneo, uh, Kano Bay, Kaneo, Kaneo uh, Bay, and engaged 11 Japanese planes. His 30 caliber machine gun jammed almost immediately, and he was left with a 50 caliber machine gun with low ammunition. Despite this, he scored one of America's first air kills, taking out 1-0. Shortly after the victory, two more A6Ms strafed him. 7.7mm and 20mm rounds hit his plane, shattering the canopy, destroying the radio, his hydraulics, and breaking the rudder cables. Uh, Lieutenant Rasmussen found a cloud bank and escaped his pursuers. Nursing the plane back to Wheeler Airfield, he managed to land despite no brakes or rudder control. Over 500 bullet holes scarred the P-36. The pyjama pilot, pilot, as he was henceforth known, um, was unscathed. Lieutenant Rasmussen scored one more victory in his service um, and served to the end of the war. He got the Silver Star and passed away in 2005. Um, so yeah, he did. He survived the war. His, uh, his plane is actually on um, on display now at the U.S. Army Air Force Museum in Ohio, in Ohio, um, and along with a pajama-clad mannequin. In game, uh, we get the P-36 A Hawk. Uh, with this rather dank skin, which is basically uh, the colours and number that the plane that Lieutenant Rasmussen uh, cheerfully hijacked on the morning. Um, it was, wasn't his plane, uh, but he found it and it was going to be his plane from then on for that battle. Uh, how's the plane in game? Well, the P-36A Hawk is a bit of a wet squib, uh, sort of damp squib I should say. Uh, it's not very good. It, it, it's not bad. It can be quite effective. You're better off chasing fighters than hunting bombers, however. Uh, one of the big issues with this plane is just the lack of offensive armaments. Now, you do have a 50 caliber machine gun and a uh, 30 caliber machine gun on board. However, the 50 caliber has extremely low rounds, and that means you have a lot of problems with it. So, you have to be very careful and choose your targets carefully. The plane is relatively good for maneuverability, however, and it's a good starting plane. You will get used to flying a a plane that has relatively good energy retention, a plane that's sort of, it's okay, I guess, it's not the worst plane in the world. You will get used to flying it and using it. One of the issues with it, though, is the engine. The twin Wasp engines are relatively good at low altitude, and it's probably got the best climb rate of any of the low-tier planes. But this comes at a bit of a problem for higher altitude flights. Once you get to sort of the mid altitude, so around about 10,000 feet above, the plane does lose a lot of power. Uh, you don't have any superchargers on board, and this does cause a lot of problems. You really do lack that compression of air, so your, your engine just starves of oxygen and you really have problems climbing any higher. The other thing for this plane is it does have relatively good roll and turn rates, but 
If you lose energy, you will really struggle and it can be very hard to maneuver the plane. Sometimes the roll rate can be a little bit sluggish, especially at high speeds. The P36A will allow you to grind a couple of good planes and it will allow you to grind out the, uh, the sort of rank 1 American planes without too much trouble. Uh, you will be facing some pretty hard planes as you fly. Uh, with a battle rating of 1.3, you'll face up to 2.3 planes, and that includes the HE-100, which is a very strong plane. Your other issue is you don't really want to go head-on with an enemy, things like that, because you do tend to catch on fire very easily. The engine at the front is very flammable, and will generally go up like anything, and that can cause a lot of problems. The plane is relatively sturdy, um, as you know, Lieutenant Rasmussen actually proved, taking over 500 shots in it, and you may think that's a very exaggerated number, but no, there, there was around 500 bullet holes in the plane when it landed, so it was basically Swiss cheese. Um, the plane in game is relatively strong, you will be able to do quite a lot with it, however your pilot is a little bit exposed, there's not much armour around him and it can cause issues. Overall, the plane's decent. You will be able to fight with most planes at your BR. Um, you're going to be fighting very early, sort of early monoplanes in this vehicle. So you don't really have to worry about more advanced planes like the like, like the Zero or the um, BF 109s and things like that. There's not many of those that you're going to be facing. As I said, the the HE 100 is one of the probably one of the hardest planes you're going to face just because it has this sheer speed advantage over you. The plane, it is, you know, for this pack, it's it's worth it. It's not bad. It's not terrible. It's just a shame it's not a premium because that really does kill the uh, the use of this plane and really does make it a little bit less effective and less useful for new players. Anyway, let's head on to the M3A1. And welcome back, so let's look at the US Marine Corps M301. Now the M3 light tank has more history than I can talk about, I and mean, well, you know me, that's quite a lot of history. Uh, with so many variants, I would need hours to talk about them all. The base of the M3 starts in the early 1940s, with the fall of France. It was obvious to America that they needed faster, better tanks, and to reform their actual armoured forces. The first batch of M3s rolled out in March of 1941. Almost all Mark I and Mark II variants went to the Commonwealth and British forces, who nicknamed it after Confederate General J.E.B. Stewart, uh, a naming right that sort of stuck with America and ended up going for all the rest of their tanks. Um, the other name was Honey, but that was really just a, a local colloquialism uh, by the British, and the Americans never stuck with that name. The reason it got called Honey was just because of its ride. Uh, it was so smooth compared to the British tanks at the time. The Americans, are sorry, the British absolutely loved it and the Commonwealth forces indeed did love it because it was just so smooth. It was just a uh, honey to drive. The M3 did well in Africa with good ride speed and protection. However, the Mark I lacked a turret basket for the crew, which, which made the two-man turret uh, a little bit of a dangerous area. Often the crew would get injured uh, along with the cupola on top of it, which uh, the British didn't like cupolas, and you'll notice that with a lot of their tanks they don't have a cupola. Uh, the reason was because it would often get penetrated and the commander's head would go missing and flop down into the turret and the poor loader slash gunner slash whatever he was doing at the time would turn to his left and see a headless commander and go, oh crap, we should probably leave the area. So cupolas were sort of not a very common thing on the rest of the tanks, and this stuck with American tanks as well. Um, the first major upgrade for the M3 was the A1 in May of 1942, as with American naming standards, just putting an A on at the end of everything. Um, and this was a big improvement. The turret had a basket. Now, when I say a turret basket, I will just stop for a moment because the turret basket is the bit inside the turret itself. So when I say turret basket, I don't mean what we call turret baskets today. Um, with the turret basket of the time, it was basically just a basket inside the turret 
which would rotate with the turret, so the crew didn't have to do a little dance inside the tank. Uh, the issue without having a turret basket was you had to turn with the turret, and often on like, rough ground and things like that, you'd fall over, and you know your turret would be turning, and then they'd, you'd get a uh, a lovely breach smacking you in the head. It was a very dangerous place to be. So the the, the implementation of a turret basket made the tank a lot better. It also meant that the turret was turned a little bit quicker because the crew had faith in it. Uh, the new welded turret and hull, although some uh, riveting was still used, and a high mounted 30 caliber machine gun. Now the previous version did have the 30 caliber machine gun on there as well, it was just a little bit of a lower sort of positioning for it. It wasn't quite as high so it wasn't quite as useful. Uh, one of the other things was the additional sort of 30 caliber machine guns in the side of the tank. So you will see with the earlier and sort of free variants, the M2, or the M2 variants really, um, the M2s, they, they have machine guns in the side of the tank, so you end up with lots and lots of machine guns pointing thwarts. The idea of this was of course that the driver could use the machine guns, he could drive around and then machine gun everything by turning the tank. Uh, this didn't turn out to be the case, so a uh, machine gun ball was placed on the front of the turret, sorry, on the front of the tank even, and the other machine guns were thrown out because it was just space and weight and area they didn't need to use. Now, the tank was still powered by the Continental Air-cooled seven-cylinder radial engine, an uh, engine that you will be familiar with if you've seen any American tank. And the reason they used it is because they had thousands of these things left over. Um, the radial engine was a, it was a little bit of an outdated model. It was still used on a fair few planes. I can't remember the actual models off the top of my head right now. But there was a few, <laughs> few planes still using these engines, but the majority went into tanks. The beauty of this engine was it was very simple and very reliable. Being air-cooled, you didn't have to worry about radiators and all that kind of stuff. In November of 1942, US forces had the first major operation and their first taste of blood really in the ground combat theatre. Although they saw success against the Italian tanks at the time, this did not last when they faced the German forces. The M3s were slaughtered by the Panzer 3s and Panzer 4s, along with the German 88mm gun that was being used in Africa because of Matildas. Uh, of course, the famous 88mm anti-aircraft gun, the, the flak gun, uh, was turned into an anti-tank gun, and it turns out that a very high-powered 88mm gun is good against tanks as well. Who would have funk it? It was clear the higher profile and flat armour were too vulnerable at this tank. One of the things you will notice about the M3 is it is quite a high profile, it's a very tall tank, and that's because of the radial engines. Uh, one of the issues with that radial engine, although it was very reliable, was it meant the tank had to be very tall, and you'll notice this with the Sherman as well. Uh, the Sherman of course using the same engine at the start, and this meant they were quite tall, they were very high up, and uh, if you compare it to other tanks, um, the, the the Shermans and the M3s and the like that used the radial engines tend to be some of the tallest tanks that were ever made. Although the M3A1 was outdated and too weak for the open fields of the European theatre, the jungle and islands of the Pacific theatre were where the lightweight smaller tanks were to shine. They were perfect for this area. The Japanese tanks of the day had much less armour and a smaller gun, which made the M3A1 a good match for it. The air-cooled reliable engine as well helped and the tank soon became a favourite of American shock troops, the US Army Marine Corps, the US Navy Marine Corps, sorry, the US Marine Corps, just the US Marine Corps in general. Um, I don't know why I put army in there, well, we get beaten up by any marines that I need now, and uh, I know a couple of marines, so I'm going to get warped by them at some stage. Um, the thing with that air cooled engine was it was so reliable. One of the things with the radial engine is there's nothing to go wrong with it. Uh, it's pretty much the simplest engine you can make almost, and that means that they're pretty easy to fix. Being air cooled as well meant that you didn't have to worry about cooling the tank, you didn't have to worry about. Uh, Cooling, you didn't have to worry about radiators, there was much less to go wrong, uh, and this meant that there was a smaller size for the tank as well. The engine bay was relatively easy to get around because it was relatively open and sparse because of uh, radial engines, a very small engine indeed. The other thing as well was the lightness of this tank also made it incredibly easy to transport, um, and a sort of 
lesson learnt with the Locust, and the, the, the tank was very lightweight, very easy to transport, could be transported by planes very easily, but more importantly by landing craft. And this made the tank perfect for early landings on beaches to support the marines as they stormed all the Japanese islands. Now, in-game, how's the tank? Well, in-game, you've got a premium tank, which is a big advantage, uh, but this is a very fast, okay armoured tank. As you saw a bit earlier, I got a hit to the side and survived it. Um, it the 37mm has okay pen, but the solid shot does lack post-penetration damage. Again, you will have noticed earlier on with the, uh, the, the Zis that I sort of had to use my machine guns almost to take it down uh, because my shell was not doing much and wolfed the shot as well. But the trouble is with a solid shot is you have to wait for shrapneling to cause any damage. Um, Post-penetration damage is lacking in the vehicle. But overall, it's a decent tank. It's a very good premium tank. It's a very good tank to learn in. And it's a very good tank to grind American ground forces with. You will have no problem at all in this vehicle. 2.0 is a fantastic barrel rating as well. It'll be a lot of fun. And this tank will help you grind up to around about the rank 3 level for American tanks. So you will easily get past rank 1 and get to rank 2 with no trouble. Rank 2 will be a breeze with it. Uh, with that extra research point bonus for it, it makes it a little easier. Um, this is one of the sort of very good little premiums that you can get, and especially in this pack, it is well worth it. So, as you probably know, I, I've already recommended this pack. I honestly can, can't say a bad thing about it. Uh, you will find this on Steam as well, and I did find this actually on sale on Steam, which was quite really weird uh, when I picked it up, so it was about $2, which was awesome. Um, because, you know, the, the amount of premium time and lines you can get with it as well are a little bit of a bonus, really, and they, they do help. But of course you get some cool little tanks. Now, the tank itself isn't unique at all. It's the same as the stock uh, Tech Tree variant. But it has the fancy US Marine Corps paint scheme. And you get a little decal, which is the US Marine Corps on the tank you can see on the side there. And that's a nice little extra that you get, and it's quite handy. All in all, I'd recommend this tank to new players. Sorry, this pack to new players. You will make it will make life a lot easier. Okay, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please uh, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon, and you know the usual things that YouTubers say. I hope you found this guide a little useful too, and let me know if you've enjoyed it because this is something different. Uh, I've not really sort of done anything like this before, so it's a bit different for the channel. So I do hope you enjoy it. Anyway, have a great day and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.